it's Michelle Ramshock, naturalist, and welcome to Virtual Experiences with the Hancock Park District. It's Friday, so we're hitting the trails. Today you're joining me along the Blanchard River at our HPD administrative office off East Main Cross. So as you can hopefully hear, we've got lots of wildlife happening here in the trees, in the water, and at our wet meadow. And that's what we're going to highlight today and some of the wildflowers that are growing in there. So we moved, our, moved here in 2002 and put this in just kind of as a little habitat for wildlife. So it's attracting birds. I saw some American goldfinch earlier and lots and lots of insects. We had a hummingbird moth come visit one of our flowers just a bit ago, so we're hoping he'll return so we can get a picture of him. So two of our flowers are native and two of them are not, but I still wanted to highlight them to you because they're kind of blooming everywhere now. And we like to talk about things that you can, again, walk out your back door, walk down the street and find. So the first one I actually had to pick because we didn't have them in our wet meadow. And this is called a chicory. It's one of my favorites. And maybe you go, yep, that's that blue flower that grows everywhere or I can't get rid of in my yard. Um, this one is non-native. So it was brought over hundreds of years ago from Europe, but it's what we call naturalized, meaning it grows everywhere now. Um, it's kind of, the population's kind of set. And again, we can find it almost anywhere. And so it has this lovely kind of periwinkle blue color to it. Nothing else really that grows around here will look like this. Um, it has nectar, it's shorter flowers. So those short tongued bees that fly around are gonna be able to readily access that nectar and drink it. Another neat fact about this plant, which is in the composite family, is that the roots, when baked, are used as a coffee substitute. And actually I was reading that some companies mixed it with their coffee when there were coffee shortages in the 1800s. So something, again, maybe the pioneers would have used if they couldn't have coffee or afford coffee. I've never tried it myself, though I would, and I imagine it might have an earthy kind of taste to it. So that is the chicory. One you see almost growing with it is Queen Anne's Lace, and we have plenty of it in our meadow here. Um, also called wild carrot, also called bird's nest. And it gets, Queen Anne was uh, a ruler of England and Scotland and Ireland, and then when it went over to Great Britain in the early 1700s, um, she was a great lace maker. And so the legend or story goes that when she was sewing, she pricked her finger with a needle and let a little drop of blood on her lace. And at the center of most of these flowers is that little red spot right there. So that's the legend of what that signifies. Um, it does have a carrot smell to it. There are parts that are edible, but again, don't take my word for it. Do your research, read your books, get more information before consuming anything. Um, there's also one that's a, a poisonous hemlock that's very similar to this. And as the name states, it is poisonous. So again, really want to do your homework on that to make sure you are um, consuming the right plant. It also has irritations, it said, um, to your skin, especially when wet. So also be careful when handling that. This one is also non-native, but again, it's naturalized and obviously you can find it many different places. So let's go on to our native flowers. The yellow one that we're seeing it's called prairie cone flower or gray-headed cone flower. It can reach three to five feet, so it's well on its way. You may also find this at our prairie that we have at Oakwoods Nature Preserve. And a neat thing about this um, are its leaves. And they're very rough to the touch, almost a sandpaper-like. So it's an adaptation it has as a prairie plant. Of course, we are out in the sun and it has to try to contain all the water that it can that it's getting from, from the ground with its roots. So having it be coarse, it's maybe not letting out as much water. Um, it's something that didn't have those coarse leaves. Attracting birds, attracting butterflies. And it said when the seed head gets dried and you squeeze it, it has an anise kind of smell to it. So that's our prairie cone flower. Um, and the last one is called wild bergamot. And that's the lilac colored one here. The genus is Monarda, so think bee balm, Oswego tea are also in that same group. And the leaves, this one are softer, but again, if you kind of rub the leaves and then smell, it has a fragrant smell to it. Also attracting insects, butterflies. We've seen lots of honeybees, or actually bumblebees, excuse me, flying around. So butterflies, when they're landing on it, will taste with their feet. So having that kind of fragrant on there 
they're able to sense that there. Um, a lot of neat things about wild bergamot. The leaves were used by Native Americans in making a tea. If you had a cold, they were also used in a poultice. So again, that's using the leaves, maybe some kind of salve, grinding them up and putting them on a skin infection or a cut and then wrapping it with some kind of bandage. They also used it probably as a tea for gingivitis or if you had some kind of sore in your mouth. There is a chemical found in the bergamot that is also readily available in today's mouthwash. So again, I'm not sure how they would have figured that out. This is something that I can put in my mouth and chew on or that will help my teeth get better. But they would have figured that out and obviously passed that information on um, from generation to generation. So I encourage you to get out, enjoy the wildflowers, come out, take a look at ours. While the office is closed, you can still come out and look at the signs that are on the site and enjoy the meadow here. Again, join us on Monday at one o'clock for Discovery Stories and have a great day.